<laughs> Hello and welcome to Rugby League Lunch Hour with LoveRugbyLeague.com, sponsored by Betfred. We've got the microphones this week, hopefully it'll work, but we're not quite sure, are we? So let us know in the comments. Another week yeah, of... Yeah, if you can't hear us. Yeah, if you can't hear us, it's just our mouths moving. Another week of rugby. Um, not much for Toronto, we talked about it last week. We we're still waiting on a decision, so we won't talk about that too much. Let's talk about the field and at the top of my list I've got uh, the third successive win for Huddersfield. Do you give Blue Robinson the job? Uh, it's a good question, Josh. I wasn't there, expecting no. to be asked that question. Um, I, I think it's always hard, I think, for caretaker coaches because obviously they come in and it's a bit like you always get you, you have to have a coach, don't you? So it's like they chuck someone in, and you always have a sort of rebound. What sort of yeah, coach there's, a gone, there's always a few wins, isn't there? Uh, you Not know, and, it, that is, but. and it's like the caretaker coach comes in and does well for a few games, but does that does that mean that they will do well, you know, on an ongoing basis? Uh, on a long term. Um, basis. Would you feel hard done by if you aim and you didn't get the job? You've got coaching, sort of. Well, I suppose that's the that, I suppose that's the thing, but then I suppose at the same time he's in the fortunate position where he's getting he's almost got you know no coach not many coaches get a bit of a they get a, a trial period, do they? And it's like. You know, if there's five people you want the hood, or, or if there's five coaches you want the Huddersfield job, only one of them is going to be the caretaker. So yeah, okay, he's won three out of three, but ultimately no one else has had the chance to be able to do that. As things go, I would probably, if I was Huddersfield, I think I'd give it Luke Robinson. I think. You think, um, you think the fans would be happy as well? Uh, he, he coaches, I think, was in that at the academy. Yeah, um, and obviously he played. And, yeah, you know, exactly. So he's, he's he was a. I, I think I said this. I think I said this. I went. I was at. I was at Huddersfield when they played Wakefield last week or week before, and uh, you know I, I was quite impressed with how meticulous and thorough he was. I was sat probably diagonally away from him, um, you know, and obviously because of the because of the no crowds and stuff, you do get a bit more of an insight into what coaches do and say. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's always a tricky one with with the coach with the coach inside. And, you know, this it, it's very. It's very popular, very hip, I suppose, to get uh, an unknown Aussie to come over and, and, and do a job. But, um, you know, I think from Huddersfield's point of view, I, I probably wouldn't have got rid of Simon Walker, but, they, you know, they have. Um, Especially in the sort of middle of the season. Yeah, I mean, that, that, well. I think that's just one of them things where if, if, if the club and the, and the coach are on the same page and, and, you know, they agree that he's leaving at the end of his contract, it becomes a little bit... I suppose it's something motivation. It's a bit, there, yeah, it's a bit awkward, isn't it? And then you've got, especially because there's not a great deal to lose from the the last few games because there's no relegation. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, not that you know, not the Huddersfield anywhere near that anyway. Um, yeah, I think yeah, you know, Robinson can't do much more than win three out of three. But yeah, it's always a bit of a slippery slope that because it's like, well, yeah, he wins five out of five as caretaker coach, but then ultimately no one else has had the opportunity to be caretaker coach. So you don't know whether if they did give it to somebody else, whether they might have won five out of five. Um, but there's not a great deal of, of proven coaches out there with you know, I, I think it's actually if you look at the way coaches have the way it's going, there's a lot of like what almost like one time super league coaches now. So, you know, Lee Radford was at Hull, you know, do you see another super league cu- club giving him a, a mm-hmm. run really? You know, Kieran Cunningham was another one. Do you see another super league club giving him him a run? Um, you know, even like I mean, I know Freyson who's gone in Ottawa now, but it's like, do you see, you know, do you see another, another, you know, another club giving him, giving him a run? It's difficult, but yeah, I think maybe Robinson's probably. I I, I think I'd I'd err on the side of Robinson at the moment. I think did that prove the sound working? The sound is working. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, on the pitch, we saw a lot of youngsters as well this week. We've obviously the chance up this weekend. It's good to see the sort of the, the next generation coming through and giving the chance and lots of debuts this, this week, hasn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny one because you know I've done a little bit of research on it this week. It's a funny one because everyone's getting really excited over Warrington playing nine academy players, but actually as a top club, I think it, 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 if you if you compare Sailings and Wigan. I had a look and St. Helens and Wigan have played eight or more academy players in every single game in 2020. And everyone's getting really excited, well, not, not everyone, but people are getting really excited about Warrington playing nine academy players. I think what it shows is that the best clubs and the most successful clubs always have a strong base of academy players that they bring through. 
into the into the first team, and I think that's probably one area where Warrington have probably struggled in comparison um, to their rivals. I think if you look across Warrington's seventeen throughout the season, they have four players basically that that are homegrown that play every week. So that's Curry, Philbin, uh, Mike Cooper, um, and Toby King. Um, who, who you could say came through their academy, and it's like they've got a massive gap to bridge. Effectively, Wigan and Saints are playing double the number of Warrington mm -hmm. players. I had a look at grand finals as well. If you look at the number of academy produced players that are in grand final winning teams, I think you have to go back to two thousand and six for a time when it was less than than eight in a grand final winning team. So to me, if I was a if I was an owner of a Super League club or or if I was looking for what the blueprint was, certainly the Heartlands team, and I know we're going to have a bit of debate on this later, um, you've got to be prioritising bringing through your own players. And, you know, we talked about Huddersfield, and that's one of the things that actually Huddersfield have done fairly well. They, they had, when they were successful, sort of at the start of the, the last decade, they had a, a, a core of, of, of homegrown players that they brought through, you know, like McGilver and Kudjo and, uh, and Mike Lawrence, people like that. And almost now, this next phase of Huddersfield players are all, you know, McIntosh. Uh, you know, I know Adam O'Brien and a few of us came in from, from other clubs, but ultimately they've gone through Huddersfield system. Yeah. And I do think that it's getting to that point where clubs should be relying on that. Um, There's obviously a correlation between youth and success, isn't there? Well, I think it's just the whole, I think it's just a lot, it's a lot, e you know, rugby league's very culture orientated and it's very like, Every man's got to fight for each other. I think it's a lot easier to instill a philosophy, a philosophy and a culture if you've got people who are around for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know the greatest the greatest dynasty of Super League is the Leeds team that was built around you know uh, seven, eight, nine mm -hmm. players that, that came through. I think Leeds obviously played Catalan last night and didn't have um, and you know played a, a second string team um, or or a lot of youth players. Um, I just think that yeah, it's good that they're getting the exposure, but I think it you know it should be used as a way of highlighting that actually, you know, clubs should be playing more homegrown players, you know, every week, not just when they want to rest players for the for the Challenge Cup, which is what you know Warrington and you know to a lesser degree Salford did. And carrying on with the with the discussion of players on the field, uh, a, a Wigan product, Tom Davies is over at Cairns now. I know he scored three yesterday against a sort of young lead side, but I think his tally's up to nine, and I think he spent a majority of the season injured. So he's 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 proving to be a good a good sign for Catalans, isn't he? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Catalan, I've got a little bit of a Wigan, uh, a Wigan contingent over there. Yes, Tierney, Tompkins, 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 yeah, McLaurin. McLaurin's there, and you know I think yeah, you know, that's probably a, a separate issue for from a Catalan point of view about what they should do. Homegrown player wise, you know, no, no disrespect to to Tom Davies or, or, or players like that, but you know, what what's happening in French rugby league that they can't have a, a winger, a homegrown winger that plays mm -hmm. every week in Super League rather than you know rather than have to, to basically bring in you know a Wigan a Wigan product to play to play on the wing, um, you know that's the way I look at, but you know. That, that's nothing to do with the actual players, that's just the way that the way that it goes. Um, it is, and obviously you're, as we know, you're sort of a big fan of French rugby league. You didn't mention it much, but you went to the Magic Weekend last year, didn't you, you injury? You only mentioned it once or twice. Obviously you saw the players that they've got, that they've got there. But yeah, but, you know, I, I've, spoke, I've spoken to a lot of people about it and, you know, there is a bit of a, there's a certainly, the feeling is that there's a big difference between the physicality of the French league and, and the English or the traditional English league, and that's one of the issues that's stopping French players from progressing is mm. that yeah they can play in the elite in the French league, but they just can't match the physicality of the of the English professional game. Um, but you know, I think there's a, it's obviously very challenging for clubs because they've got a balance. Yeah, you know we're you know I, yeah we've got to develop players and bring through more players. But ultimately, they've got to get it's a results business, and they've got to get results on the field. You know, Catalan. I think Catalan should bring through more French players, or should do certain. You know, certainly do more to give French players opportunities. But at the same time, 
the amount of money that they spend, they're going to be judged if they don't finish top four. Yeah. And, it, and ultimately, if Steve, Mac, Steve McNamara decides that having Tom Davis and Joel Tonkins is better than having two homegrown players in their positions in terms of getting to top four, well, you know, you can't you can't blame them for that. Can't judge them too much on that. Um, just before we came live as well, 21-man squads were announced for the Challenge Cup. Uh, and I talked about this later, but might as well talk about it now. Might as well preview the weekend's action and get your predictions and thoughts on it. Uh, and they got a full house last week, Josh. You, 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 did, one, yeah. you did. Uh, a list of stars return. Uh, Brad Delia returns for Leeds after um, testing positive for coronavirus a couple of weeks ago and horrible returns. Uh, you probably didn't want to share this, but <laughs> you, you, you got a strange bet on Coronado, haven't you? One, a 40 to 1. <laughs> well, no, to I, one. I did put. I did put um, I did, put a, I did put a pound on Comrade Hurrell to win Man of Steel. <laughs> Obviously, I was very confident it was going to happen. Um, it would have been a nice boy. I mean, that's quite an interesting debate who would win Man of Steel because I don't. At the minute, if you had to choose. If people, choose are, now. If people are watching, if people are watching and they've got any ideas for Man of Steel contenders, please do leave them in the comments. Obviously, Comrade Hurrell's not going to win. I it. don't think he's in the top five just yet. But yeah. who knows? You know, Leeds might if they win something. I don't even know. I think the thing is with me is I don't. I don't like backing sure things. You see, and I think when you're looking through and thinking, oh well, you know, I want, I want a bit of value for me pound. For your pound. Well, Devin French. Um, that's who I went with. He was a massive twenty, which I thought would be twenty to one. So I thought it was, was quite big for a star full-back at a club that sh should be winning something. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of talk as to whether they'll give they'll give it to sort of Ron Burrow or, oh, or yeah, Mossy yeah. Masai or something like that, but I think there will be, there will be it'll be a play on. Yeah, they yeah, might give them a, a sort of... Yeah, there'll be some, yeah. Thing, yeah. Um, just, well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, Bevan French, like I say, probably, um, probably going to be a candidate. It's difficult because... Oh, because like this, right? Because of the way that because of the way the season's been so fragmented, um, like obviously you had the first six or seven games and then you've had this period of games. And I think it's it's very difficult because it feels like the games are just being played to get through the end of the season. And sometimes it yeah. feels like maybe there isn't there isn't as much sort of focus on who's doing well and and, and who's playing well than than the might have been. To get the season um, done. It, it's interesting because I think St. Helens are a good example of this again. Is that would would you pick out a St. Helens player? Are you saying Warms are there? St. Helens are one of them where because the whole team plays consistently well every week, they're almost a, a victim of their success because one player doesn't stand stand out as much because they're all you know. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, whereas, yeah. whereas if you're, whereas if there's a standout player in a bad team, you score and all your tries, yeah, yeah. Yourself, there's yeah. a standout player in a bad team, and you think, oh, he plays every week, and you know we get there, then you know he's a candidate. Whereas in a better team where everyone's playing well, so you can't stand yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So, so what, challenge cup then. Challenge cup. What what are your, your your predictions? Let's see if you can. Oh, um, feel good again. I think I think it'll be Wigan Warrington. I, I just I think couldn't, I couldn't argue with you. Either. I think you know, obviously, well done, Salford for getting. I mean, well, I say you know, Salford. It'd be, a, you know, imagine a massive achievement for Salford if they can get to the Challenge Cup final. You know, a year after they got to the to the Super League Grand Final, um, you know, that'd be a, a massive achievement for them. Um, I just feel that maybe Warrington's big big game experience maybe might might swing it, but then at the same time, because it's going to be played behind closed doors. Do you do you lose yeah. that sort yeah. of big sort game of crowd behind? You yeah, do you, you know it's not a case of it's you know there's not loads of fans you know there's no fans there. So do you lose that sort of aura of it being a big game? Is it just another game? And if if you were to put Salford against Warrington in a another game, I think you'd give Salford a chance. I'm not saying that they've not got a, got a chance, but I think Warrington have got a decent track record under Steve Price. I think the. The grand final is actually the only final they've not made since Price took over. Um, you know they've been they've been grinding out results, Warrington in in the league. Um, but Salford might look at it and think, well, they've got they've got nothing to lose. I think yeah. so. I, I can't remember the exact date, but Salford haven't been in the Challenge Cup final for I think fifty years or, or more. Um, you know, and, and speak to a few Salford fans that you know they say it's. It'd be a typical sort of thing to happen that they get through to the Challenge Cup final and no one can go and, and no and they can't go. Um, so yeah, I think that that I think that's a I think I, I do think Warrington will be too strong for Salford, but then 
at the same time, it's it's a credit to Salford that they keep putting themselves in these in these positions. You know, they, they got to the the, the semi final. Was it they got to the semi final three seasons ago? So you know they've got they've had a decent run in recent years where they've had two cup semi finals and the grand final. If they can make a, a Wembley final on top of that, considering the budget and the, the size of the crowds that they have, yeah, it's yeah. A, you know, fair yeah, achievement. A big, a big achievement. I think Wigan and Leeds will be a close one. I think Leeds are sort of on the up and but Wigan are a strange one. I know it was it was quite tight again. Well, not too tight, but against Wakefield probably should have been a bit more comfortable than it was. But in the bigger games, Wigan know how to win, don't they? But Leeds are still they're still on the up. They've got well, I think Jack Walker's back now. Uh, obviously, the competition for Richard Mahoney. You've got Luke Gale, Mark Louis in the house. I think that'll be a bit a bit a bit tight. My picture. Yeah, Leeds have been a funny one this year because sometimes you watch them and you feel like they, they, you know, they're going, for, you know, they're making steps forward. But then other times you watch them and they just remind you of how they were last year and yeah. you know they've been pasted a couple of times. But then at the same time, they have pulled off some decent, decent results. Um, I think Leeds are probably still. I think Leeds are still probably below where they would want to be, but then at the same time, I still think they've got a chance of, of beating, beating Wigan. I'm not sure, again, Wigan are up there, but I don't think, a bit like Warrington, I don't think Wigan have played, I don't think they've like, played brilliantly, the, I don't think you know. played the best rugby, which I think we said this last week, if you can win and not play your best, yeah. that shows a sign of a good team, I guess, isn't it? You know, Wigan have got, um, you know, really like the whole the whole French, the French Hastings and, and Harry Smith sort of combination, which I think Smith's not been playing as much recently, you know, because they need to accommodate Lou Lyon um, and Powell in it, but I think I think I I'd go for Wigan. Wigan, I think it, it'd be the twentieth one with it this year if they if they were to win Challenge Cup this year. Um, I, I I think I'd I'd side with Wigan just because I feel like Wigan are a, a bit more consistent than Leeds are. Um, interesting, you know, they both rested players this week to give them that bit of leading into the into the semi final but it's good to have it's good to have two semi finals that are, are hard to call as much as I'm saying I think Warrington and Wigan are gonna win you, you wouldn't be surprise. it wouldn't be a massive surprise if it was Leeds and Leeds and Salford. Um, you know, because don't forget we've had semi finals there. I remember Wigan beat London Broncos seventy odd nil or something in, in one of the semi finals and we've had finals like that. So um, exactly. yeah so hopefully we are you know hopefully there's two very competitive games and two very close games that that, that people can enjoy and um, and yeah. Comment your thoughts, but one one thing on the Wigan for me, you mentioned there's young Harry Smith, Lula Light Hastings. Something they've been doing this year is they bring on Smith and they put Hastings in at nine and keep Lula Light back in the house. Whereas Lula Light has been a sort of number nine in his career. I think he played nine for New Zealand, nine for New Zealand Warriors, and Hastings surely you think is the best sort of running half of the two. So that's a for me watching, I always think it's quite interesting to see Hastings go at nine because he, he doesn't have as much freedom there, does he? And but well, Smith, Smith's been he's been fantastic when he comes on. I think I'd like to see him make a link up with Hastings. Maybe it's a fitness thing because Lou is sort of coming towards the end of his career, but he's still proving to be one of the hardest tacklers. So I don't think he, he couldn't do a job in the middle. Yeah, I think you know Lou Lai's kicking game. I think's probably stronger, but you know might you might be you might be right. Maybe they feel like if they play Lou Lai at hooker, he's going to get through too much work and. And not be able to play yeah. the full eight, and they'd rather have him on. Lula is a tremendous. I think he's probably a. I'd almost, I'd almost go down the line of a bit of an underrated player. You know, if you look at his durability, he's. I think he's barely missed a game. You know, over the years for, for Wigan, you know, tough tackler. Um, he's one of the best. You know, tack, one of the hardest tacklers. Yeah. I think, for, for especially for size. Yeah, creative. You know, creative player, and I think interesting about it. You know, you, you can never accuse Wigan of of not bringing through academy players and it's interesting that Harry Smith probably got an opportunity at the start of the year when he wasn't expecting it and you know that hook up he had with Hastings and French and uh, mm -hmm. he's so good that he, he sort of played his way into, into contention which gave a little bit of a headache because like I say you'd probably on the face of it say well why would you not just interchange Powell and, and Lulai but then at the same time Lulai's probably one of your leaders but you can't really you don't feel like you want to have him on the bench. You can't really. You don't. Smith's playing that well. You don't feel like you can leave him out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, French is at fullback, so you know he's which, staying which there. Towards the end of the game, you find him sort of on the wing. I think it gets Wakefield. French then made the move to the wing, and Hardik gets a fullback. Uh, and when he goes to the wing, they sort of concede one or two tries. I think Tom Johnston scored a try when French moved to the wing. So I don't know if that's 
just just something they do once they think the game's won, but they do like mixing it around with you during the 80 minutes. I was I was adamant at the start of the season. I thought French should play standoff because Good I man. thought Hardy could would be shooting for the fullback. But you know you can't argue with French playing fullback. He's you know he's been, so far, been one yeah, of the standout yeah. players. And Drew always predicted French should be fullback, didn't he? Yeah, he said that. It's interesting that you know it's interesting for Hardacre that he's out in the centres because you would imagine that he probably would rather play at fullback and would probably rather be that the, the linchpin yeah, sort of hands on ball because you know uh, as much as everyone's important clearly fullbacks are a much more key position than, than centre and um, Hardacre could probably play fullback for, for the majority of teams in the league so um, but. Yeah, I still I think Wigan. I think Wigan will. I think Wigan will beat beat Leeds and um, and then we'll see what the final is. Yeah, I've obviously spilled water all over my uh, all over my paper uh, like a like a muppet. But I've got what's on side with the latest Championship and League One news. And interesting enough, Dewsbury have already announced their squad numbers for next year. Well, uh, I've seen something yesterday that said that they think maybe Championship's not going to start till March, which would mean a year between games. Right. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I mean, yeah, really goes to be announcing squad numbers. Maybe, maybe, a bit maybe they're all going to shift the plenty of shirts before Christmas. Well, maybe, yeah, and they've not announced the number five or number nine in there, so I don't know if maybe they're waiting to sign a few more. Uh, and Liam Finn and Paul Sykes will go again. Um, interesting mailbox you had this week. I've got a few few comments on Facebook. I can't believe that St. Helens should be in the semi-finals following that try that came off Anthony Gelling's head. Um, I think he quoted the rule, it is illegal to head the ball in a forward direction, but it wasn't really, in t- my, my if we to comment on that, I don't think it was intentional, was it? No, it was of, course, you know, of course it wasn't intentional. So if you look at that rule, and I, yeah, of course it wasn't intentional, and I think, you know, that happens, there's a few There's a few sort of rules that are open to interpretation, <coughs> there, and it's like, they used to have the, you know, he's not played at it, sort of rule for, for a knock-on, whereas I think now, it's a knock on, it's a knock on, isn't it? Basically, yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I suppose you could you could maybe apply that to, to that Gelling one where it's like, well, yeah, he didn't mean to head it, but it still went forward off his head, whether he meant it or not. Yeah, um, so maybe it's yeah, you could say, if I'm running on to the ball and I've, and I've dropped the ball, I didn't mean to drop the ball, I've just dropped it, you know what I mean? Um, but bottom line is, they give it and yeah, well, it's in the red ball. The result. Well, one thing that, that that, that made me think, I, t- I think I'd mentioned it to you a couple weeks ago, was that Aiden Caesar try. Uh, I think it was against Castleford. And he oh. kicked it, and I thought, he, I, I couldn't see from the clip if he kicked it again. And you told me he tapped it on again. And yeah, I, and he I tapped it his arm. And a player must not intentionally, not the ball forward, have hand or arm, nor throw forward. And I know that got a lot of attention, but uh, to me, that was that try I shouldn't have been given because he's tapped it to gain an advantage over the fullback. I suppose, again, it's an interpretation thing because it's like, well, did he deliberately propel the ball for, you know, did he deliberately off the kick? Or was it a genuine attempt to catch the ball and it just... And it's just gone over. You know, and then he's caught it, did he deliberately go like that to knock it over? That's another one where maybe you need a rule to say, right, none of this, because obviously it's led to an opinion, my opinion would be that that shouldn't be a try. Well, then at the same time, if, you, if he was running along, say, and there wasn't a play there, so let's take the player out of that equation, if, if he kicked over and then he's juggled the ball and then caught it five yards on, you wouldn't say that was a knock-on, would you? It says in the rules an exception is made when the player is legitimately and briefly juggling with the ball to get control of it. So that's that rule. I, to me, he's, he's gained an advantage by tapping it over the fullback. Well, but it was still, I mean, the try was given, as you say, and it was a good try, so I mean, I won't, I won't, I won't bring it up every week. And I think the game was pretty much won by then anyway, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, a try winning game. Uh, elsewhere um, on the site, everything you need to know ahead of the NRL finals, that kicks off tomorrow, we'll be watching it in the office tomorrow morning. Tim Spears re-signed with York. Another There's one. some age in that York team. There is some experience as well. <laughs> that's, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> that's a nicer way to put it. Uh, we'll talk about York five minutes if you want. Uh, they're putting a, together a nice squad, aren't they, for a championship push next year. And it's, got, it's happened quickly because it was only promoted from League One a couple of years ago. Yeah, they've got a lot of experience forwards. Um, obviously, they've got Ryan Atkins in as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't, I, mean, I don't. I presume they've still got another couple of signs. I think we were talking last week. Just don't know whether at half back they've got enough. But um, yeah, because Robinson, he's gone to Halifax, hasn't he? He was obviously there. Yeah, you know, choice. I think, I think for me, the key, 
if you if you were gonna, you know, I think York are, York have got as good a chance as anybody. But I think if you look at if you look at squads, you want to look at the one six seven nine first. Um, That's the, the backbone. Of yeah, the, and I think yeah, and, uh, you know, not taken away from the signings York have made into you know Cuthbertson and um, Kermond and, and Washbrook and Clarkson who was already there and, and Atkins in the centres and I still think that they're they're good quality players but they're on the the key the key men that have made the difference are going to be one six seven and nine um, and I think that there's probably three or four. One six seven nines in championship that are better than what York have got um, at the moment, but you know they might pull. Yeah, well, they might yeah, pull smart there's, there's Still plenty of time. I think it's quite must be exciting to be a, a York fan at the minute. Oh yeah, it's successful. It's a it's a it's great going. it's a great um, it, it's a great sort of opportunity for York because they're sort of close enough to the Heartlands to attract players, but they're in a city. Yeah. You know, it's a it, you know it's a a relatively glamour, glamorous place to it's go nice to. City, yeah. You've it's got a new stadium, stadium so yeah. they've got you know they what they bring to the table is a lot stronger than what certain Super League clubs bring to the table. Uh, and I think the thing is, is they'll almost be immune from the sort of abuse that the likes of Toronto get because yeah. they've you know they've been around for a long time and um, worked hard. To get they, where they they, are. You know, that, that's not to say Toronto have worked hard, yeah. but you know clearly it, it, it just fits that pattern of a club progressing and. And getting up there, so um, you know, I think without naming names, I think it it certainly be beneficial for rugby league if York could replace you know at least one or two of the current Super League teams. Elsewhere on the site, Wayne Bennett uh, could be set for the Queensland State of Origin job. Scott Taylor is set to return to action after six months out, and uh, Brisbane Broncos announced Kevin Walters as their new head coach after getting the wooden spoon. I think for the first Walters time. Walters was at Catalan, wasn't he? He was for two years. He didn't yeah. do a particularly good job. Uh, and what was, I remember was it early 2000s at the time, I think oh, it was. I don't remember him doing yeah. a particularly good job. Well, he's back there. Obviously, he's been at Queensland for the past, I think, four series. Um, 13 Welsh breaks nominated for Cardiff Bay statue. Uh, Malta International heads to Whitehaven. And Dan Sargent has had his ban overturned, while his teammate Lee Yates wasn't so lucky, was he? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the Yates one's odd. I mean, how you can appeal a ban twice is, is beyond me. Salt had obviously decided that he shouldn't have been banned, but the way they were going on about it, I just think it was a bit... A bit of a... You know, I understand Ian Watson saying... I understand Ian Watson saying that, um, you know, he's not that sort of player and stuff like that, but if you've appealed it once and they've said no, you know... Shouldn't that be it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the debate, we'll, we'll finish with the debate. Uh, this was this is your idea. Should there be a minimum number of academy players in, I think it was a 21-man squad? I think in the 17. The 17. So what would your minimum... Because obviously you've well, seen the success you, of youth. You're so asking me a minimum number. to have a number, what number would it be? I mean, obviously it's easier to do. I, I think... Well, I mean, I suppose you could say it in the 21-man squad. Um, which makes it a bit easier because obviously... I mean, all, all I'm saying there is if you do 21-man squad and you say it's got to be four, well, they're just going to pick 17 and four. Yeah, that makes it nice to I think there should be a minimum number. I think certainly for the Heartlands team, I think in all this, you know, we, we go on about the all this talk about expanding the game and, um, you know, these overseas teams coming in and, and, and basically cleaning up a load of players. I think one way that, one thing that the Heartlands teams can do that the overseas teams can't at the moment is produce players. And so I think that there should be more there should be more older, you know, if a team wants to be in Super League, they need to be bringing through their own players. Mm -hmm. um, unless, of course, they add something else in terms of a commercial, you know, whatever. Um, it's that, you know, the reason why people want Toronto in Super League isn't because they want them to produce players. It's for the commercial. It's for the commercial it's side. Sports, the um, <coughs> whereas I think if, whereas I think the main way that a you know the main way that a Heartlands team can can prove themselves is by bringing through players. So, you know, I mentioned Warrington before. I think don't think they do enough to bring through their own players. I think it's you know it's very easy to go out and and buy. Well, well, when I say it's very easy, I mean you, you've still got to buy the right players, but. Um, you know, Salford a good example of that. You know, it's disappointing, and obviously it's a bit of a legacy from the from the previous ownership that you know it's, it's disappointing that Salford don't have a have a category one academy or a mm -hmm. category two academy. You look at they have two a you know even in a 
in a side, in understrength side against Swansea, they had two academy products in the 17, and that's with them resting a load of players. Um, and so I, don't, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think yeah. that's good enough because what are they? What are they doing to add, to add to the play pool? You know, it's, they're not. You can, yeah, you can, yeah. Of course, Ian Watson's done a good job in bringing players through from other clubs, uh, you know, and turning them into good players. But I just think that two. For, for if you're a rugby league club that's been around for 100 years, to have two players that have come through your academy in a in what is a, your reserve team, yeah, yeah. I just think that's disappointing. And I think that's that's a good example of why people who want to expand the game, which you know everyone wants to expand the game, I think that's I don't think a team like a club like Salford can excuse that. Um, you know, you look at. The, th- the fact is, we talked before, St. Helens, Wigan, Leeds, all built on strong academies and, and bringing through. You know, it's, not, it's not really easy to find players and bring them through, but um, plenty of clubs in Huddersfield, I mentioned, are doing it. You know, I, you know, I talk about you know, Witness, Witness have, had, have had, run their academy yeah. for a while. And, you know, you look at... I think you're pretty proud of being out a few half-backs at Super League clubs, didn't you? Well, no, I, I just think, I think Witness is a good example of you know they've run academy. They've maybe got a lot. Of, they've maybe had players who maybe, you know, not. If you look at Witness, players from Witness who uh, the better players will end up at Saints, Wigan. Mm-hmm. You know, so like Harry Smith from Witness, he's at Wigan. Mark Percival from Witness, he's at Saint Helens. So Witness is the process that Witness have had from their academy is they've almost taken on not rejects, but they've had to be almost like a plan B for for some players. But they've managed to keep developing that play pool. And if you look at them teams, you know, look at Warrington and Salford the other night. You know, Salford had more Witness Academy players playing in Salford's team than Salford had. Yeah. You know, and that's just like that's that, that's that's for it to get to that point is is you know I just think that's strange. Isn't it? Obviously, that that's just an example. You know, I know a lot about that. So um, it's not just a. I think Huddersfield's a good example of bringing, bringing players through, but I just sort of think, yeah, we have this quota on, there's a quota on non-federation trained players and, you know, you can't have more than X number of overseas players or whatever, but I don't think that does enough to put, do you know what I mean? It doesn't do enough to tell, to say to teams, you've got to have homegrown players mm-hmm. in there because... So if it was you, I don't know, have you said the number yet? Have you oh, said the number? I don't so know. Said to you, it needs to be a minute, in a, just a 21-man squad. Which obviously could, I, I could think, be. I think it should be. I think it should be. I think it should be five or six at and least. Then, and then at least two are probably getting played. If yeah. Say four I, I don't. I don't see this. how. I don't see how. I don't see how that should be an issue for anybody. Um, because I think, yeah, okay, you can say you're only allowed three, whatever it is, quota players or non-federation training, but that doesn't encourage you to develop players because you can just go and. You can just go and buy all Wigan, the players who dropped out of Wigan's academy and played in. Um, Which we could see more of next year in the discussion. I think I think the reserve system for next year is still postponed. So we could see a lot of units have lost in the game. Well, that, that was one of the points that the, one of the points that Steve Price was trying to make, wasn't it? Where he was saying, well, there's nowhere for these guys to play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the combination of the reserves, the academy and, and dual registration it isn't working at that moment in time. Um, Warrington are letting go of Welsh Robson, who I think is a very good player. I think he should be playing Super League, but he's going to end up playing in League One next That's season. Right. Although, uh, is there a possible Super League clause in this contract? I think yeah, but I think, you know, I think, the pro- I think the problem is is that with players like that, I think if he's going to make it in Super League, it'd likely be with Warrington. Yeah. Because I think he's... Because yeah. that's the thing, when you've brought someone through your academy for three or four years and he's not played, it's a bit of a gamble for, say, Wakefield. To come so along and say, right, we're going to make him part of our first twenty, one of our twenty-five man squad, yeah, yeah. because they don't. Yeah, okay, he's had one or two good games that you know at Warrington, but he's not proven himself yeah, at Super League level. Um, you know, and and, you, and it does make you wonder how many players are like that that have been in clubs, academies that have been let go at twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two when they've not had a chance, who have just been lost to the game. Yeah, um, yeah I said that could happen again next year. Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah, it's a shame because obviously this week's proven that the future is bright and there is some brilliant players coming through. Yeah. That would be a, a shame. I mean, there's a conversation about dual reg and how that all works. 
there's another conversation to be had. That part of me wonders whether you you'd be better having the reserve teams playing in playing against you know playing in League One or something like that, or doing not mess or maybe changing the structure somehow and and. Because I just think the way even bringing back reserves this year, I mean, it didn't, it didn't really get going, but it, it didn't really seem like it floated many people's boats. Yeah, in the return yeah, I think the reserves. Think the teams, if it didn't have to be in it, would you want no, to have it? No, part, part of me wonders whether put, you know, creating a development league or something where Wigan could put a reserves team that goes up against Coventry Bears or whatever yeah. would actually work. Um, you know, Wigan, Wigan, Wigan could call the reserves Charlie Warriors or something as a way of outposting it a little yeah. bit and, and creating a bit of you know a bit of interest beyond Wigan um, you know Preston or something like that where you'd still maybe get diehard Wigan fans who might want to go and watch there is you know Wigan, Wigan Super League play on a Friday night the if the reserves the play on the Sunday you, you know people yeah. might go to yeah, yeah. to them both and I think maybe if you if you made it a bit more glamorous than playing in a reserves league and, and maybe put them up because I think that's one of the challenges that that the game's got in League One is that you've got the Heartlands teams who are obviously clearly stronger than like Doncaster and Hunslet and teams like that. And you've got the likes of Coventry and London Scholars and teams like that who are wanting to develop. Like Coventry and London Scholars don't want to play each other. They do in that league environment, but they don't want to play in a Southern League. They want to play against Doncaster and Hunslet because they want to improve. But in terms of that overall, but it sort of skewers that league. Whereas if you can figure out a way of integrating Wigan's reserves or Warrington's reserves or something into a system that benefits everyone, I, no, I think that I think that's probably worth looking at. So what did we say your number was? Six, five or six, six five, five or six, six, and that's the rest. That's all I've got. Me. That's a quarter. That's yeah. nearly a quarter. Yeah. I mean, five or six well, is yeah. basically a quarter, isn't it? So. And as you say, you've proved success and it has been in the past. Well, that, the final, know, that, so that's the thing. No one's bought. No one's going to lose out on it. Get rid of your paper. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's, all, drink now. that's all for this week. Uh, thanks to Betfred for their continued support. Make sure to check out loveofbelieve.com for all the latest news. Uh, Drew might be back next week, but I'm not sure. It could be me again. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see you then.